Step into a world where the clashing of swords resonates with tales of loyalty and deceit. The samurai, icons of honor yet not immune to the darker shades of human nature, our narrative cuts through centuries of legend, revealing the truth behind the armor. From heroic acts of bravery to the cold-blooded moments of betrayal, from the serene acceptance of death to the struggle for life amidst chaos, we trace the fine line between nobility and brutality. In the soft, shifting shadows of Japan's 8th century, a new force began to stir. This wasn't the emergence of an empire or the birth of a religion, it was the rise of the samurai. Welcome to another episode of Plaid Chronicles. From humble beginnings as provincial guardians in the Nara period, 710 to 794, to becoming the defining military elite of the Heian period, 794 to 1185, their ascent is a tale not just of war, but of the profound transformation of a nation's identity. The Nara period was a time of cultural blossoming in Japan, marked by the construction of the great Todaiji Temple and the creation of the Daibutsu, the great Buddha statue, symbolizing both religious devotion and imperial power. Amidst this cultural renaissance, the seeds of the samurai class were sown. Initially, these warriors were mere protectors, serving local aristocrats in a largely ceremonial capacity. They were tasked with the protection of provinces and the enforcement of the aristocracy's will, including the collection of taxes. As the capital moved to Heian Kyo in 794, marking the start of the Heian period, a significant shift occurred in the power dynamics of Japan. The central government, while still influential, began to lose its absolute control over the distant provinces. Local aristocrats growing in power and influence needed more than ceremonial guards. They needed warriors who could assert their will and protect their interests. Thus, the bushi, a warrior class that would later evolve into the samurai, came into prominence. During this period, the bushi were not just soldiers. They were a class unto themselves. Bound by a nascent code of honor that emphasized loyalty and martial skill, these warriors began to embody the ideals that would later be formalized as Bushido, the way of the warrior. They were trained in the art of combat, skilled in the use of the bow and the sword, and adept in horsemanship. The Heian period is also known for the emergence of the samurai's iconic armor, which evolved to meet the demands of their role. The early Yoroi armor was designed to be lightweight, allowing for mobility and agility on horseback. The Kabuto helmet was crafted not just for protection, but as a symbol of status and identity, often adorned with elaborate decorations. The samurai's rise was not merely a military phenomenon. It was deeply intertwined with the political and cultural shifts of the era. As the influence of the central government waned, the samurai became power brokers in their own right. They served not just as warriors, but as administrators, land stewards, and advisors to the aristocracy. Their influence extended to the imperial court where samurai families like the Taira and Minamoto began to assert their power. However, this rise to power was not without its conflicts. The late Heian period saw the emergence of the Genpei War, 1180 to 1185, a national civil war between the Taira and Minamoto clans. This conflict was not just a battle for control, but a defining moment in the samurai's history, showcasing their martial prowess and strategic acumen. The war culminated in the pivotal battle of Dan no Ura, where the Minamoto clan emerged victorious, leading to the establishment of the Kamakura Shogunate, Japan's first military government. In this era of shifting power, the samurai's role expanded beyond the battlefield. They became patrons of culture, influencing the arts, literature, and even religious practices. The samurai's dedication to Bushido also fostered a deep respect for education and the arts, leading to the creation of works like The Tale of the Haika, 
a war narrative that not only chronicled the Genpei War, but also encapsulated the samurai's ethos and aesthetic sensibilities. The world of the samurai was one of contrast, the harsh realities of war and the refined elegance of courtly life. It was a world where loyalty was paramount and honor was more valuable than life itself. This dichotomy is captured in the famous saying from the era, Bunbu Ryoto, the pen and the sword in accord, emphasizing the samurai's dual dedication to both martial and cultural pursuits. As the Heian period gave way to the Kamakura period, the samurai's role in society continued to evolve. They were no longer just provincial warriors or the muscle behind aristocratic ambition. They had become the very backbone of Japanese feudal society, a force that would shape the nation's history for centuries to come. As dawn broke over the Kamakura period, 1185 to 1333, a new era was ushered in with the clashing of swords and the silent promises of loyalty. This was the epic that saw the samurai not just rise, but soar to the heights of power and influence in Japan. The 12th century, a time of seismic shifts in the Japanese sociopolitical landscape, marked the genesis of an era where the samurai emerged as the linchpin of governance and culture. At the heart of this transformation was Minamoto no Yoritomo, a figure as enigmatic as he was powerful. In 1192, after a series of brutal conflicts that culminated in the Genpei War, Yoritomo established the first shogunate, a military government that would dictate the rhythm of Japanese politics for centuries. This was more than a mere political shift. It was a redefinition of power dynamics, placing the samurai at the epicenter of authority. Yoritomo's shogunate was not just a new chapter in governance, but a bold declaration of the samurai's supremacy in the tapestry of Japan's history. The Kamakura period saw the solidification of the feudal system, a hierarchical structure that pivoted around the samurai. As military retainers, they served both the nobles and the emperor, but their loyalty was often complex, entangled in a web of familial ties and feudal obligations. This period was marked by a delicate balance of power, where the samurai wielded their swords with the precision of a calligrapher's brush, writing and rewriting the boundaries of lands and loyalties. Under the Kamakura shogunate, the samurai evolved from mere warriors to rulers in their own right. Their influence extended beyond the battlefield into the realms of administration and governance. They were not just enforcers of the shogunate's will, but active participants in the shaping of policy and law. This period saw the emergence of the Gokunin, vassal lords who pledged fealty to the shogun, further entrenching the samurai's role in the political hierarchy. The Kamakura period was also a time of significant cultural development. The samurai's influence permeated various aspects of Japanese culture, from the evolution of traditional arts to the shaping of religious practices. Zen Buddhism, with its emphasis on discipline and meditation, found a deep resonance with the samurai, influencing their approach to both life and death. As the Kamakura period unfolded, it brought with it a series of invasions by the Mongols. These invasions tested the mettle of the samurai, their strategies and weapons clashing with a foreign power that threatened to unravel the very fabric of Japanese society. It was during these conflicts that the samurai's martial skills were honed to perfection, their strategies and tactics refined by the unforgiving flames of war. The famous quote, in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity, attributed to Sun Tzu, echoes profoundly in the context of the Kamakura period. It was a time of tumult, but also of tremendous opportunity for the samurai. They seized this moment to not just assert their power, but to embed themselves indelibly into the identity of Japan. As the 13th century waned, the Kamakura shogunate faced its own set of challenges, both internal and external, leading to its eventual decline. But the legacy of this era, the era of the samurai's rise, remained etched in the annals of history. It was a legacy of power, discipline, and an unwavering commitment to a code that transcended the mere act of warfare. 
The Kamakura period, therefore, stands as a monumental testament to the samurai's journey from warriors to rulers, from mere swordsmen to the architects of a nation's destiny. It's a narrative that continues to captivate and inspire, a reminder of the enduring power of loyalty, honor, and the unbreakable spirit of the samurai. In the heart of medieval Japan, under the shadow of towering castles and amidst the echoes of clashing steel, the samurai reached the zenith of their power. The Muromachi period, 1336 to 1573, a time of both cultural renaissance and relentless conflict, saw the samurai not just as warriors, but as pivotal figures in the unfolding drama of Japanese history. This era, characterized by the rise of the Ashikaga shogunate and the tumultuous Sengoku period, was a crucible in which the true essence of the samurai was forged. The Muromachi period began with the establishment of the Ashikaga shogunate in 1336, marking a significant shift in the power dynamics of Japan. The Ashikaga clan, under the leadership of Ashikaga Takauji, seized control from the failing Kamakura shogunate, ushering in a new era of samurai governance. This period was characterized by a decentralized power structure, with the shogunate exerting less control over the distant daimyo, the powerful regional lords. It was in this landscape of fragmented authority that the samurai truly consolidated their power. The Sengoku period, 1467 to 1603, often referred to as the age of the country at war, was a time when the samurai's martial skills were put to the ultimate test. As the central authority of the Ashikaga shogunate waned, Japan descended into a chaotic era of near-constant military conflict. The samurai, serving their feudal lords, engaged in countless battles, sieges, and skirmishes, honing their skills in the crucible of war. The Sengoku period was not just a time of conflict, it was an age that shaped the very identity of the samurai. During this era, the development of arms and armor reached new heights. The samurai's armor, known as yoroi, evolved to become more functional and elaborate. The kabuto, helmet, became a symbol of the samurai's status, often adorned with intricate designs and family crests. The armor had to be both protective and flexible, allowing for mobility in the diverse terrains of Japan's battlefields. The weapons of the samurai also underwent significant advancements. The katana, with its curved blade and sharp edge, became the soul of the samurai. Crafted with meticulous skill, the katana was more than a weapon. It was a work of art, a symbol of the samurai's honor and skill. Alongside the katana, the yumi, longbow, remained a crucial part of the samurai's arsenal, particularly for mounted archery. The Muromachi period was also marked by significant cultural developments, influenced heavily by the samurai. The principles of Bushido, the samurai's code of conduct, continued to evolve, emphasizing virtues such as loyalty, honor, and self-discipline. Zen Buddhism, with its focus on meditation and mindfulness, resonated deeply with the samurai ethos, influencing their approach to both life and warfare. The Ashikaga shoguns, particularly Yoshimitsu and Yoshimasa, were great patrons of the arts. Under their rule, traditional Japanese art such as tea ceremony, no theater, and ink painting flourished, reflecting the refined sensibilities of the samurai class. The famous rock garden of the Ryoanji Temple in Kyoto created during this period, exemplifies the Zen aesthetic that deeply influenced samurai culture. The constant state of warfare during the Sengoku period led to significant advancements in military tactics and castle construction. The samurai developed new strategies to adapt to the changing nature of warfare, including the use of firearms, which were introduced to Japan by the Portuguese in 1543. Castles, such as the formidable Azuchi Castle built by Oda Nobunaga, became symbols of power in strategic military bases. It was a time when the samurai fully embraced the transient nature of life, dedicating themselves to the pursuit of excellence in both martial and cultural endeavors. As the 16th century drew to a close, 
the Muromachi period gave way to the unification of Japan under powerful warlords like Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. The era of the samurai as feudal warriors was coming to an end, but their legacy, forged in the fires of the Muromachi period, would forever shape the cultural and historical landscape of Japan. As the 17th century dawned over Japan, a profound transformation swept across the land, heralding an age of unprecedented peace and order. This was the Edo period, 1603 to 1868, a time when the warrior ethos of the samurai was channeled into the foundations of governance and culture under the watchful eye of the Tokugawa shogunate. It was an era that saw the fierce samurai evolve from battlefield heroes to stewards of peace and administrators of a unified nation. The period commenced with the rise of Tokugawa Ieyasu, a figure whose name became synonymous with both unification and the establishment of an era of peace that would last over two and a half centuries. Following the tumultuous years of the Sengoku period, Ieyasu's victory at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600 marked a pivotal moment in Japanese history. His ascension to the shogunate in 1603 signified not just the end of civil war, but the beginning of a new order where the samurai's role was redefined. In this newly unified Japan, the samurai underwent a significant transformation. From their roots as warriors, they transitioned into bureaucratic roles, becoming the administrators and officials who ran the day-to-day -day affairs of the Tokugawa regime. This shift was not merely occupational, but represented a deep change in the samurai's identity. They were no longer just the sword arm of Japan, but its guiding hand, responsible for maintaining the law, collecting taxes, and managing land. Their new roles required not just martial prowess, but also a keen understanding of administration and governance. The Edo period was also a time of remarkable cultural development, heavily influenced by the samurai class. With the cessation of warfare, the focus shifted from martial training to education and the arts. Samurai were expected to be as skilled with the brush as they were with the sword. This period saw an explosion in literacy and learning, with the samurai at the forefront of a cultural renaissance. The ethos of Bushido, the way of the warrior, continued to be a guiding principle for the samurai. However, its interpretation evolved during the Edo period. The emphasis was no longer solely on martial valor, but on virtues such as righteousness, loyalty, and self-discipline. Bushido became a moral code that governed every aspect of a samurai's life, from public service to personal conduct. The world of the samurai during the Edo period was one of paradoxes. They were warriors without a war, leaders in a society that valued harmony and order above all. This period saw the samurai channeling their energies into scholarship, poetry, and the tea ceremony reflecting a shift from physical prowess to intellectual and artistic pursuits. It was a time when the samurai's sword, the katana, often rested in its scabbard, a symbol of power and status rather than a tool of war. One might wonder how did the samurai reconcile their warrior past with their new roles as bureaucrats and patrons of culture? This question invites us to delve deeper into the psyche of the samurai, exploring the adaptability and resilience that defined them during this period. The Edo period was also marked by a strict social order with the samurai class sitting at the top of the hierarchy. This system, while rigid, provided a stability that allowed for economic growth and cultural flourishing. The Tokugawa regime implemented policies that isolated Japan from the outside world creating a unique environment where Japanese culture could develop without external influences. This isolation did not mean stagnation, however. The arts and sciences flourished, with the samurai contributing significantly to fields such as astronomy, medicine, and cartography. Cities like Edo, modern-day Tokyo, and Kyoto became centers of culture and learning, drawing scholars, artists, and philosophers from across Japan. The famous quote by Miyamoto Musashi, The way of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death, 
took on a new meaning during the Edo period. For the samurai, the acceptance of death was no longer literal but metaphorical, representing the death of their identity as warriors and the birth of their new roles as leaders and cultural icons. As the 19th century approached, the Edo period slowly began to unravel. The arrival of Commodore Perry's black ships in 1853 and the subsequent opening of Japan to the West triggered a series of events that would eventually lead to the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate and the end of the samurai era. Yet the legacy of this period, the transformation of the samurai, the cultural advancements, and the unprecedented era of peace would forever mark a defining chapter in Japan's history. As the 19th century unfolded in Japan, a nation steeped in centuries-old traditions stood on the precipice of monumental change. This was an era that witnessed the decline and transformation of the samurai, a class that had been the backbone of Japanese society and culture for hundreds of years. It was a period marked by external shocks and internal upheavals, culminating in the profound reshaping of Japan's identity. The late Edo period, 1853 to 1867, was the twilight of an era. The arrival of Commodore Matthew Perry's black ships in 1853 was a stark wake-up call for Japan. Perry's fleet, with its imposing steam-powered ships and advanced weaponry, shattered Japan's two centuries of self-imposed isolation, exposing it to the overwhelming currents of Western influence. This event triggered a seismic shift in Japanese society, setting off a chain of events that would lead to the end of the samurai era. As Western technology and ideas began to permeate Japan, the samurai found themselves in a rapidly changing world where their traditional roles and values were increasingly questioned. The Bakumatsu, the final years of the Tokugawa shogunate, saw the samurai at the heart of political upheaval. This period was characterized by a complex interplay of loyalty, honor, and a desperate struggle to preserve a way of life that was being overtaken by the tides of change. During the Bakumatsu, the samurai played pivotal roles in various political movements, some advocating for the opening of Japan to the outside world, while others fiercely resisted, clinging to the ideals of a fading past. The internal conflict and civil strife that marked these years were not just battles over territory or power, but a profound existential struggle for the soul of Japan. The Meiji Restoration of 1868 marked the end of the Tokugawa shogunate and the beginning of a new era. This period, named after the Meiji Emperor, heralded the rapid modernization and westernization of Japan. One of the most significant changes during this era was the abolition of the samurai class. This was not just an administrative reform, it was a symbolic act that marked the end of feudalism and the ancient social order that had defined Japan for centuries. The Satsuma Rebellion in 1877, led by the samurai Saigo Takamori, was a final dramatic stand against the changes sweeping across Japan. This rebellion was the last major uprising by the samurai, a poignant symbol of their resistance to the loss of their status, their way of life, and their very identity. The rebellion's defeat not only quashed the last vestiges of armed samurai resistance, but also marked the definitive end of the samurai as a social class. In the wake of these tumultuous events, the samurai faced the daunting task of integrating into a new societal order. In feudal Japan, a figure both romanticized and steeped in tragedy emerges from the shadows of history, the ronin. These masterless samurai set adrift in a rigidly structured society that prized loyalty and honor above all, tread a path marked by solitude and despair. Their story is a poignant chapter in Japan's feudal era, reflecting the turbulent undercurrents of a society in flux. The origins of the ronin can be traced back to as early as the 12th century, during the tumultuous times of the Genpei War, 1180-1185. However, it was during the Sengoku period, 1467-1615, a time of ceaseless conflict and shifting allegiances, 
that the phenomenon of the Ronin became particularly pronounced. The constant warfare of this era resulted in numerous samurai losing their lords, either through defeat in battle or political maneuvering, leading to a significant increase in the number of Ronin. Historical records suggest that in the late 16th century, there were as many as half a million Ronin in Japan, a testament to the era's instability. Life as a Ronin was fraught with hardship and uncertainty. Stripped of their status and income, these masterless samurai often found themselves living on the fringes of society. Many turned to mercenary work, lending their swords to the highest bidder, while others resorted to banditry, living outside the law they once upheld. The Ronin's existence was a stark contrast to the structured life of a samurai in service. It was a life marked by poverty, social stigma, and a relentless struggle for survival. One of the most graphic and sorrowful episodes in the history of the Ronin is the tale of the 47 Ronin, an event that occurred in the early 18th century during the Edo period. After their lord, Asano Naganori, was compelled to commit seppuku, ritual suicide, for assaulting a court official named Kira Yoshinaka, these loyal samurai found themselves without a master. Led by Oishi Kuranosuke, they plotted for over a year to avenge their lord's honor. Their story culminated in a bloody assault on Kira's residence in 1702. After a fierce battle, Kira was found and beheaded. However, this act of loyalty and revenge had a tragic end. The Ronin were ordered by the shogunate to commit seppuku for their crime, an order they obeyed, thus adhering to their samurai code even in death. The Ronin's tale is not merely a narrative of loss and vengeance, but also a reflection of the complex social dynamics of feudal Japan. These masterless samurai, while often romanticized in literature and film, lived lives that were inherently tragic. They existed in a societal limbo, caught between the honor of their samurai past and the harsh realities of their present. Their existence challenged the rigid social order of their time, representing both the resilience and the desperation of those who found themselves without a place in a rapidly changing world. In Japan's storied past, few elements capture the imagination as vividly as Bushido the Way of the Warrior. This ancient code, as articulated by Inazo Nitobe in his seminal work, Bushido the Soul of Japan, delineates the seven cardinal virtues guiding the samurai, Japan's elite warrior class. These principles, righteousness, loyalty, honor, respect, honesty, courage, and consistency, were not just ideals, but the very essence of the samurai's existence, shaping their actions, decisions, and ultimately, their legacy. Righteousness Egi, at the heart of Bushido, lies righteousness. For the samurai, righteousness was more than moral rectitude, it was the unerring compass that guided every decision. This principle demanded that a samurai make choices not based on personal benefit, but on what was morally right. The famous samurai Minamoto no Yoritomo, the founder of the first shogunate, exemplified this virtue through his commitment to establishing a government based on laws and order rather than mere martial strength, loyalty, chugi. Loyalty was the lifeblood of the samurai ethos. In the tumultuous era of feudal Japan, where allegiances were often tested, the samurai's unwavering loyalty to their lord and clan was paramount. The legendary loyalty of the 47 ronin, who avenged their master's death despite overwhelming odds, stands as a timeless testament to this virtue. Honor, meyo. For the samurai, honor transcended mere reputation. It was the invisible yet unbreakable thread that connected them to their ethical and moral principles. To live and die with honor was the ultimate aim of a samurai's life. Takeda Shingen, a preeminent daimyo, lived by these words, a samurai's head may be taken but not his honor, underscoring the intrinsic value of honor above life itself. Respect, Rei. Integral to the fabric of samurai life was respect. This virtue was manifested in their adherence to etiquette, understanding of hierarchy, and reverence for others, regardless of their status. The respectful conduct of the samurai towards both friend and foe in battle, 
often noted in historical accounts, reflects their deep-seated commitment to this principle. Honesty, Makoto. In a world where one's word was their bond, the samurai's commitment to honesty was unflinching. This virtue was not just about truthfulness in speech, but encompassed integrity in all actions. Miyamoto Musashi, in his iconic The Book of Five Rings, emphasizes the importance of honesty in mastering the art of the sword and life, illustrating its centrality in the samurai's moral universe. Courage, you, the samurai's courage was legendary, but it was not the absence of fear. Instead, it was the ability to face and overcome fear. This courage was not only physical, but also moral, the courage to do what is right. The tales of samurai charging into battle, exemplified by the likes of Uesugi Kenshin, highlight the physical bravery inherent in this virtue. Yet their moral courage, often demonstrated in standing up for justice and righteousness, was equally significant. Consistency, or meio. Finally, consistency, often referred to as honor in Nitobi's Bushido, was about living these principles every day. It was not enough for a samurai to exhibit these virtues sporadically. They had to be a constant in their lives. This consistency in living out the values of Bushido is what elevated the samurai from mere warriors to exemplars of a way of life. The seven virtues of Bushido were not just abstract concepts. They were the tangible standards by which the samurai lived and died. These principles shaped not only the conduct of the samurai in their time, but have continued to influence Japanese society and the broader world. Bushido, in its essence, is a path of self-discipline, ethical behavior, and moral rectitude, offering timeless lessons in honor, loyalty, and integrity. In understanding these virtues, one gains insight not only into the heart of the samurai, but into the soul of Japan itself. Beneath the sheen of cinematic glamour that often enshrines the samurai, lies a more complex and sometimes darker reality. It's a tale not just of honor, but also of brutality, a mirror to the Knights of the West, who, beneath their chivalrous facade, waged violence in the Crusades. This video merely scratches the surface of the samurai's legacy. To truly grasp the depth and dichotomy of their existence, we must venture into the shadows of their history. Join us as we delve into the samurai's world, not shying away from the grim chapters of their story to understand the full spectrum of their way, life, and history. In feudal Japan's history, few tales are as chillingly vivid as the downfall of Toyotomi Hidetsugu in 1591, orchestrated by his uncle, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a figure renowned for his paradoxical blend of visionary leadership and brutal ruthlessness. This episode, soaked in the blood of political machinations and familial betrayal, is a stark portrayal of the merciless nature of samurai-era governance. Toyotomi Hideyoshi's ascent from a peasant background to Japan's paramount ruler is a story of cunning, bravery, and unbridled ambition. By the late 16th century, Hideyoshi had unified Japan under his rule and was eyeing expansionist campaigns into Korea and China. However, beneath this veneer of grandeur lay a propensity for sudden, vicious cruelty, a trait that would manifest in the tragic fate of his nephew and adopted son, Hidetsugu. Hidetsugu, initially favored by Hideyoshi and positioned as regent, seemed destined for greatness. His fall began with the whispers of his alleged brutalities and indiscretions, tales of wanton violence, indiscriminate executions, and perhaps even rumors of madness. These acts, abhorrent even in a brutal era, cast a shadow over Hidetsugu's character and were seen as potential threats to Hideyoshi's authority. The turning point was the birth of Hideyoshi's biological son, Hideyori, in 1593, rendering Hidetsugu an obstacle to Hideyori's ascension. The intricate dynamics of samurai politics, where power was often maintained through bloodshed, set the stage for a harrowing purge. In 1595, Hideyoshi's wrath was unleashed. Hidetsugu was accused of plotting a coup and was ordered to commit seppuku, a form of ritual suicide emblematic of samurai honor. The execution of Hidetsugu, however, was merely the overture to a much larger, more gruesome massacre. 
Hideyoshi, in a bid to eradicate any challenge to his rule, ordered the extermination of Hidetsugu's family and associates, a chilling act that saw the beheading of men, women, and even children. The corridors of Kyoto ran red as dozens, by some accounts over 50, of Hidetsugu's kin were mercilessly slaughtered, their heads displayed on spikes as a macabre warning to any who might dare challenge Hideyoshi. This episode of Bloodletting stands as a grim testament to the era's brutal politics. Hideyoshi, a ruler capable of immense cultural and political achievements, also demonstrated a capacity for chilling violence. The massacre was not merely an act of familial betrayal, but a calculated political maneuver designed to consolidate power and prevent any future insurrections. This dark chapter in the history of Hideyoshi's reign provides a visceral insight into the ruthless measures taken by rulers in feudal Japan to secure their power. In the intricate weave of Japanese history, the Onabu Geisha, female samurai warriors, stand as symbols of both the grace and ferocity inherent in samurai culture. These women, transcending the conventional boundaries of their roles, in a heavily patriarchal society exhibited extraordinary prowess in both martial arts and strategic acumen. Their stories, from the legendary Empress Jingu to the formidable Tomo Gozen, weave a narrative of resilience, skill, and indomitable spirit. Empress Jingu, immortalized in Tsukioka Yoshitoshi's 1880 painting, defies easy categorization. Renowned for her military ingenuity, Jingu is believed to have led a successful invasion of Korea while pregnant. This feat is notable not just for its strategic success, but for its symbolic defiance of gender norms. Jingu's binding of her body and donning of men's attire for battle underscores a fierce determination that transcended the era's societal expectations. Post-victory, she continued her rule over Japan, a reign marked by peace and prosperity, until her centennial year. Her depiction on a Japanese banknote in 1881 was a fitting homage to her extraordinary legacy. The Onabugeisha were trained in the use of the naginata, a weapon that became synonymous with their identity. This polearm, with its gracefully curved blade, was perfectly suited for combat offering a balance that catered to the Ona Bugeisha's often smaller stature compared to their male counterparts. In the peaceful Edo period, the Naginata transcended its martial utility, becoming a status symbol among noblewomen and later evolving into a discipline of martial arts during the Meiji era. One of the most celebrated Ona Bugeisha was Tomo Gozen, whose exploits during the Genpei War 1180-1185 are chronicled in the epic tale of Haiki. Known for her exceptional skills in archery and swordsmanship, Gozen was a warrior of unparalleled prowess. In 1184, during a critical battle, she led a contingent of 300 samurai against a formidable force of 2,000 Taira warriors. The battle was a maelstrom of bloodshed, with Gozen cutting through enemy ranks with a blend of graceful ferocity and tactical brilliance. As one of only five survivors, her legacy was further cemented in the subsequent Battle of Awazu, where she decapitated the leader of the Musashi clan, a feat that underscored her martial excellence. The political landscape of feudal Japan also saw Onabugeisha like Hojo Masako, wife of Minamoto no Yoritomo, the first Kamakura shogun. Following her husband's death, Masako, despite taking vows as a Buddhist nun, remained a pivotal figure in political machinations, influencing the succession and governance of the shogunate. Her actions during this period significantly altered the perception of women in politics, showcasing their ability to wield power effectively. The Onabugeisha were a distinct class within the samurai order, often emerging during times of conflict to protect their households and communities. Their significant presence in battles like the 1580 Battle of Senbon Matsubaru, where they comprised a notable portion of the combatants, highlights their martial capabilities. In the 16th century, the emergence of female ninjas, or kunoichi, 
added another dimension to the narrative of women warriors in Japan. Figures like Mochizuki Chiyome, a noblewoman turned spy master, recruited and trained a network of female spies. These kunoichi operated under the guise of shrine maidens or geisha, gathering intelligence and executing covert operations for their clans. The Battle of Aizu in 1868 is a poignant testament to the Onabu Geisha's valor. Nakano Takeko, leading the Yoshitai, exemplified the fierce spirit of the female samurai. In the heat of battle, she sustained a fatal bullet wound, but with her dying breath, instructed her sister to behead her, a final act to prevent her enemy from claiming her body as a trophy. This moment, marked both the heroism and the tragic end of an era for the Onabugisha. The onset of the Edo period, however, marked a gradual diminishment in the status and roles of these women warriors. Their legacy, once vibrant and influential, was increasingly overshadowed by male-dominated narratives. The tales of their battlefield valor and strategic prowess were relegated to the margins of history their contributions eclipsed in the evolving societal norms. In the ruthless and blood-stained annals of samurai history, the practice of collecting enemy heads following a battle was not merely a grim tradition, but a symbol of honor and proof of a warrior's valor. This custom, deeply ingrained in the samurai's code, provided a visceral testament to the brutality and the ceremonial aspects of feudal Japan's warfare. The head viewing ceremonies known as kapakiri were macabre events where the severed heads of enemies were meticulously prepared for presentation. These heads, once belonging to fierce warriors, were washed with great care, their hair combed and teeth blackened, a practice that signified nobility. Set upon wooden stands, each head was labeled with the name of both the vanquished and the victor, creating a grisly tableau of conquest and death. This ritual, while celebratory for the victors, also carried a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the ever-present shadow of death in the samurai's world. In one infamous instance, the ritual led to the downfall of a powerful daimyo, Imagawa Yoshimoto, after capturing two of Oda Nobunaga's forts, Yoshimoto, consumed by overconfidence, paused his campaign for a head-viewing ceremony and a musical performance. This delay proved fatal. During the preparations, Nobunaga's forces launched a surprise attack, turning the tide of battle in a devastating ambush. In a cruel twist of fate, Yoshimoto's own head was claimed and became the grim centerpiece of Nobunaga's subsequent victory celebration. The head-based reward system, while intended to honor brave samurai, was not immune to manipulation and deceit. Some samurai, driven by greed or the desire for recognition, falsely claimed the heads of low-ranking soldiers as those of esteemed heroes. This practice of deceit undermined the integrity of the system and at times became so pervasive that some daimyo forbade the taking of heads altogether, urging their warriors to focus on the larger objective of victory rather than personal gain. These practices ranging from the solemn jisei to the communal sakayaki paint a vivid picture of a class bound by honor, duty, and a deep sense of mortality. The jisei, or death poem, was an intimate final act of a samurai facing death. Whether poised on the brink of battle or preparing for seppuku, the samurai would compose a poem to encapsulate his final reflections. These verses were often poignant, infused with both the acceptance of life's impermanence and a stoic embrace of death. The act of writing a jisei was a moment of introspection, a solitary confrontation with one's mortality. It humanized the samurai, stripping away the layers of armor and stoicism to reveal the contemplative, often sensitive soul beneath. Each syllable was a testament to their life, philosophy, and the fleeting nature of existence. The blood oath, or ketsuzoku, was a visceral manifestation of the samurai's unyielding commitment. 
By marking the pledge with his blood, the samurai was sealing his fate to that of his lord or cause. This ritual was more than a mere formality. It was a sacred bond, a pledge of unwavering loyalty unto death. The blood oath epitomized the samurai's life, one where personal desires were often subordinate to the demands of duty and honor. These rituals and customs, each a thread in the rich fabric of samurai culture, offer a glimpse into the lives of these warriors. Far from being mere agents of war, samurai were complex individuals who grappled with questions of mortality, loyalty, and honor. Their rituals were not just traditions, but expressions of their deepest values and reflections of their innermost thoughts and fears. The world of the samurai was one where the brutal realities of war coexisted with a profound appreciation for the beauty and transience of life. In their poems, their shared cups of sake, their rites of passage, and their solemn vows, the samurai found meaning and a way to navigate the rigid structures of their existence. These practices humanized them, offering a more nuanced understanding of a class often viewed only through the lens of their martial prowess. In essence, the customs of the samurai reveal a culture that was as rich in introspection and camaraderie as it was in discipline and valor. They provide a unique perspective into the lives of these storied warriors, highlighting their humanity amidst a life often dominated by the sword. If this narrative resonated with you, do support us. Hit that like button, drop a comment with your thoughts, and subscribe. Thank you for staying with us to the end. See you in the next video on Plaid Chronicles.